We are in John chapter 8 today. We're just going to look at one verse where Jesus proclaims that he is the light of the world. Now, John chapter 7 and 8 uh, take place during the Feast of Tabernacles, probably in A.D. Uh, 29. Tabernacles came at the end of harvest, either in late September, early October, and uh, it was, like all the other Jewish feasts, both a celebration of some aspect of the harvest and also a remembrance of some important event or events in history. And so during tabernacles, the Jews moved out of their houses and lived in temporary shelters that they made out of sticks, leafy branches, or tents, and uh, they still do this. And they lived there for a week. Uh, tabernacles is just the old Latin word for tents. And it's also marked the, the end of all the harvest. The, the fruit was in, the olives were in, the grapes were in, and so it was a time of, of uh, being able to relax. It was a time of abundant food. It was a very joyful time. Now, in these two chapters, Jesus has a couple of very memorable things to say. In chapter 7, he says, On that last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Now, this probably was connected with one of the special rites that was part of tabernacles. Um, at the end of the feast, they would have a solemn ceremony, and they would take a pitcher of water that it was drawn from the Pool of Siloam, and they would pour it out. And this was part of their prayers to God for good rains that autumn. They needed those autumn rains so that they could plow and they could get their winter wheat in. The second memorable teaching is the one we're going to look at today. In John chapter 8, verse 12, when Jesus spake again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light, light of life. During tabernacles, because much of this took place in the evenings, uh, they would bring out these big uh, oil lamps, four of them, and they would set them in the courtyard of the temple and they would light them. And so Jesus is responding to that. At the, last, at the end of the, of the, the feast, they ceremonially uh, put them out. And so Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Now, Jesus uses a certain um, form when he is talking about his mission from God and his relationship to God. Uh, and John highlights these. These, uh, these are I am statements, and there are seven of them. And this I am is related to the, the time at the burning bush when Moses asked God his name. Who shall I say sent me when I go to see the Israelites? And God said to Moses, and this is Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And so the, the seven I am statements, we've looked at one of them already. I'm the bread of life. Today, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10, I am the good shepherd and I am the gate for the sheep. Then in chapter 11, with the resurrection of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. In chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in chapter 15, I am the vine. So Jesus, when Jesus declares, I am the light of the world, he is claiming intimate unity with Jehovah God. And he's also describing his ministry as the bringer of divine light. So this morning, what I want to do is do a kind of a whirlwind tour of the verses in the scripture about light, because this is a really important theme 
in Scripture. There are 263 times that light is mentioned, about two-thirds in the Old Testament, one-third in the New Testament, that it's really important, especially in the books of Psalms, Job, and Isaiah in the Old Testament, and in the teachings of Jesus. And in almost all of these cases, it's used as, as a metaphor, as a symbol for godly knowledge and action. So, the first big set of scriptures we want to look at are proclaiming that God is light. So in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, we are told, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies us from all sin. God is light. He's not just the creator of physical light. He's the embodiment of both physical and spiritual light. From our God, who is light, comes all power, all life, all knowledge, all enlightenment. John adds that God is absolutely pure. There is no darkness in God. Because, see, light... Darkness isn't anything except the absence of light. When light comes, darkness has to go. We look to God as the standard for our purity, as the one who empowers us to say no to sin. And through Jesus, God is transferring us out of the kingdom of darkness in this world into the kingdom of his light. In John, in Revelation 27.1, we're told a little more about God is light. God is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The God who delivers us both from our enemies. It is the Lord who delivers us from both our enemies and the fear of our enemies. When we're connected to God, he dispels all fear, because fear is part of darkness. Scripture goes beyond that. In Psalms 20, 36, 9, we are told, for you, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. God is the source of any understanding we're going to have, especially about spiritual things. We cannot understand spiritual things apart from having a clear understanding of God and his will. Proverbs 6.23 says, For this command is a lamp, this teaching is a light, and correction and instruction are the way to life. We know God's will because he's given it to us in Scripture. And as we do his will, we find life. And those who believe in the Creator and agree that He's the source of physical life must also recognize He's the source of godliness that leads to eternal abundant life. Because here's the second big truth, and that is, apart from God, there's only darkness. And so if we try to live a life that ignores God's will, we will be in the dark. John 3, 19, and 21, 19 through 21 says, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. People that decide they're going to live their life without paying any attention to God don't say, I, I want to live in darkness. But that's where they end up. If we choose to live independent of God's will, independent of doing what he has said, 
and we focus on our own selfish ambitions, we always end up stumbling around in the dark. It's characterized by ignorance of God's will. It's characterized by hostility to God. In Romans 1, 21, Paul says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so they, they come into darkness, and this darkness especially affects the fact that we can't understand our Lord without submitting ourselves to His will. Paul goes on and tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, 4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel that's displayed in the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Why do people reject the gospel? Because they're spiritually blind. And this is also deals with their hostility toward light. In John's introduction, in John 1, 4 and 5, he says, in him, and he's talking about Christ, was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, this has been, always been an interesting verse for me because that phrase, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it, uh, uses the word that is translated here, overcomes, but it also means, in almost an equal amount of times, comprehend or understand. People who make themselves at home in the darkness because they want to live in rebellious independence can certainly not overcome God's light, but without God's grace, they cannot even understand God's light in Jesus. We might ask, well, which one of these did, he, did John mean? Did he mean that we don't, can't overcome or we can't understand? And the answer probably is both. John loved multi-layered language, and probably he chose this word because it had both of these meanings. People who choose rebellious independence from God, they're happy in the darkness because it's the natural place for sin. Paul reminded the Roman Christians that the, since they had chosen to come into the light of Christ Jesus, they no longer should seek to live as they did when they were in darkness. Romans 13, 11 through 13, and do this. Understand the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime not carousing and in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. The painful truth about darkness is that when we choose, or when a person chooses to live independently of God, to live in darkness, they will find themselves in darkness for eternity. Darkness is one of the ways that Jesus talks about eternal condemnation. In the parable that he tells about the talents, one of those servants lived as if the master's will didn't matter at all. He took the master's uh, fortune that he had entrusted to him and he ignored it. And so the master says, throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I read somewhere, I think it was C.S. Lewis, that when we submit ourselves to God and, and walk in His light, that we will enter into eternity, and when we look back on this life, we will see that we were on the edge of heaven all the time. The person who makes a decision to walk in the darkness will enter into eternal darkness, but they will enter into eternal darkness before they're cast into hell. In, 
Our big, third big truth is that what our scripture says today, Jesus is the light of the world. He is the source of spiritual light that God has sent. This is part of his mission, is to light our way to God. And it's not the only time that Jesus talks like this. In John 9, 5, he says, I, While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And in John 12, 46, I have come into the world as light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Jesus proclaims himself to be the clearest source of true knowledge about God and about godliness. And John, in his introduction to the, the gospel, makes this startling statement about Jesus. In John 1, 17 and 18, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known to us. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Paul told the Corinthian Christians, the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made this light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God displayed, or the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So since Jesus is this clearest picture of who God is, this, this clearest way for us to have a grip on God. God is so huge, and our minds are so limited. We have in, in Christ a, a human-sized representation of God, the image of God, in, invisible God, visible for us. And if we ignore him, if we don't focus our lives on, on following his example and following him, then we're going to be in the darkness. We're going to be stumbling around. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Mark 6, 22 and 23 said, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? This is a bit obscure, and, but I think part of it at least means that when we have decided not to put Christ at the center of our lives, that we have put ourselves in the dark. And all of our decisions that we make in this life will be made out of darkness and not out of light. We will, we will have unhealthy eyes and we will be in deep darkness but like one of those breathless TV commercials where it says, wait, wait, there's more. There's more. Not only is Jesus our clearest source of knowledge of God, but the Heavenly Father has made him the author of eternal, abundant life for us. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. John 1.4 and when, when Jesus meets Martha at Lazarus' tomb, he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. We follow Jesus as our life giver into eternal life. But that's not the end. Jesus isn't just satisfied to bring us into a connection with the Father. He wants to bring us into conformity to his personality. So we've read this scripture. I want to read it again from uh, Romans chapter 13. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. And we could add a lot of other things, not in gossip, 
not in quarreling, not in selfishness. The Lord not only wants us to live habitually in His light, He intends to make us light for this dark world. This is our last big truth uh, this morning, that because we are in Christ, we become light. Listen to what Paul told his readers in Ephesians chapter 5, 8 and 9. If you, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. You notice he doesn't say you were once in darkness and now you're in the light. He said you once were darkness and now you are light. He says something very similar in Philippians chapter 2, 15 and 16. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold forth the word of life. And so this brings us to another light of the world verse that we're very familiar with there in Matthew chapter 5, 14 through 16. Jesus says to his followers, us, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You are the light of the world. And then he gives two different examples, one for us as a community. As a community, we are to be a city on a hill. In those times before electricity, if you were out on the roads after dark, you could hardly see a thing. Maybe if there was a full moon, it would help. But if you saw the, the town you were headed for and all the windows had a little light in them, then you said, here's where I'm going. Here is my, here is my rest and my haven for the night. But he uses a second metaphor. It's one that is not as clear to us because we don't use oil lamps anymore, thank goodness. Um, this was before glass shades. And so it, in order to keep your oil lamp from, burning, from being blown out by some stray breeze, if you weren't using it, you could put it under a bowl. I have to prop, prop that bowl up again so there's plenty of oxygen. But that would keep the breeze from blowing that lamp out. But it would also make the lamp completely useless. You couldn't see anything with that lamp. It cut off all the light. So Jesus says, we're not under a bowl. We're not being protected. We're up on the lampstand, high up, where the winds of this world blow, and we are to give light to our neighbors so that they can see the way to God. Finally, we are to... Do good in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of God, so that our neighbors can thank God that he has authentic followers in this community. So we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I would, if I heard this sermon from one of my uh, students when I was teaching people how to preach, I'd say, too many scriptures. And uh, yes, but there was a reason <laughs> Maybe not the greatest reason, but I, I thought it was important for us to grasp just how huge it was when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He was saying, I am God, the creator of light and the creator of truth. And I am from God to show you the way to light and truth and life with God. Jesus claimed divine power. He claimed authority. He asserted himself as the source of spiritual knowledge, as the giver of life. And he called us to obey his teachings, to trust him, and not to be afraid. We live in a dark world, but we don't need to be afraid because we're in the light. 
Jesus is the one who reveals the invisible God to us so perfectly. And he gives us the way to the Father. In our efforts, if our efforts to know something about God do not center on knowing Jesus, then we're going to stumble around in the dark. Our thinking is going to end up futile. That means useless. If we follow him, we won't walk in the dark. But if we reject him as our master, we will not be able to know God's will. When we put our trust in Jesus, the penalty for the, our rebelliousness toward God, and this is high treason, God is our king, and we have rebelled against him, and the penalty is eternal death. That penalty is paid by Jesus. Through Jesus' death on the cross, sin, the sin that separated us from God has been taken away, and we're brought into, brought into relationship with our Father. And the very Spirit of God that lives, uh, comes in to live with us and to live in us and to begin the transformation of us from darkness to light, to conform us to the personality of Jesus. Are you here today? Maybe you're watching online and you've never given your life to Jesus. Let this be the day that we say, Lord, I trust you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to make you the master of my life from here on out. And then please share that with uh, some of us here so that we can give you some guidance, pray with you, encourage you, help you as you get started following Jesus. We who have put our trust in Jesus and are following him today we have to ask ourselves, are we light in our little world? Have we turned our backs on all the deeds of darkness? So many people in the world are, are flaunting this as the way to live. But we know what it is. It's darkness. It's destruction. As a congregation, are we a light? Are we a city set on a hill? that beckons the, the, the traveler in the night to say, come in here is a haven from the darkness. Are we as neighbors in our community showing the good works of our Lord and giving the credit to our Lord, giving the glory to our Lord so that our neighbors are praising God, that they live with us. This is who we are because we belong to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are our light. Lord, we thank you that you have shown us how to live, how to depend on God with our whole hearts. You have given us freedom from sin. You have made us children of God. We've been adopted into God's family. Lord, help us to live this week with our back to sin, with the power that comes from you to say no to sin. Lord, help us to live this week as light so that our neighbors, the people around us, will see you in our lives. We'll get hungry for having what we have and that we will be able to share with them the good news that you are the light of the world. Amen.